And if you're, if you have the worst conference of anyone, we're going to give you an award. <laughs> because that would be a paradox, wouldn't it? And G.K. Chesterton is the master of the paradox. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, an inconvenience is only an adventure, wrongly considered. Whereas an adventure is an inconvenience rightly considered. And so someone at the banquet will be unfortunate enough to drink from the cup of inconvenience. This is it right here. Only a few have ever drunk from this cup, because this is the same cup that we wash it every year, but this is the only one. It's only one of these, and it has the inconvenience is only an adventure wrongly considered by Chester engraved on it. We have some past winners of the award are here tonight. Kurt and Becky Griffith back in, uh, it was in Reno, Nevada, right? Where just, a, oh, St. Louis, where everything went wrong, yeah. She, she, she ended up with broken bones and everything. Yeah, it was just great. Then, uh, right now, I'm in the running to win. Uh, the very first uh, people ever to drink from the cup were Richard and Sherry. Chris, where are you guys? Yeah, there they are. They, uh, they drank from the cup uh, when, when they had a... Uh, a tree fall through their picture window at their oh house and they drove away to the conference to the sound of chainsaws. <laughs> but they weren't going to miss the conference. So they, uh, they got three. But I think one of the greatest stories is uh, Mary Ann Rickard, who that was Reno. In Reno, Mary Ann Rickard, her, her husband Charlie came up to me and said, I think I've got a, I think I've got a nomination for your Job Award. It's called it the Job Award. His wife was in hospice. She was dying. And she said, I want to go to the Chesterton conference. She took an extra blast of chemo and she came. The best thing is, she's here tonight. <laughs> stays with us, the cup of inconvenience, but the winner does get the mug of consolation <laughs> to take home with them, and it says, I drank from the cup of inconvenience. <laughs> this year's logo on it. So if you think that you're having a bad conference, don't complain. Come and see me and tell me how bad it's going to be. I don't want to hear your complaints. I want to hear some really good Horrible stories. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then there's this mug right here. Oh, that was me. And uh, uh, speaking of technical difficulties, we have uh, three gentlemen here who are in the process of making a documentary about G.K. Chesterton. So if you see them around, it's Eric, Joe, and Sean. They're going to be filming all weekend, and they may want to interview you and just get your reaction to something. Uh, please, uh, please try to act like an adult. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, there's certain people that I don't want you to talk to. I'll tell you who they are. Okay. In fact, Tony, stand up right now. Tony, <laughs> Tony, there's Tony from New York, Long Island. Don't talk to him. <laughs> no, talk to him. He's great. So, so uh, they just got back from England. They uh, they interviewed uh, Aidan Mackey and uh, Father Ian Carr over there, and they went to the Oxford Library. They went to Beaconsfield. So it's going to be a marvelous uh, documentary that they're making. So we certainly pray for the success of that. And we're just thrilled to have them here tonight. Uh, of course, tomorrow night we'll be seeing the uh, the episode from uh, uh, Bishop Barron's new series, and, uh, and he he was on location for. Uh, for uh, lots, lots of the scenes and that, so you're going to be thrilled to see that as well. 
And then we have the Clearahue contest. For those uh, of you who don't know what a Clearahue is, it is a poem, uh, four lines long. The poetic form was invented by Chesterton's uh, lifelong <laughs> boyhood friend. They, they invented it in uh, school together. His name was Edmund Clearahue Bentley, so the poetic form is named after Bentley's middle name. It's an AABB rhyme scheme. It's a biographical poem. The first line must end with the name of the subject. AABB, and it has to have a slightly wrong meter. <laughs> it should be metrical except for when it isn't. A sometimes studied lack of meter. Uh, but uh, uh, one of Chesterton's is the, uh, the people of Spain think Cervantes is worth half a dozen Dantes. An opinion opposed most bitterly, bitterly by the people of Italy. <laughs> right. The thing I like about Clive is that he is no longer alive. There's much to be said for being dead. <laughs> one of our past winners, the, the late great Francis Farrell, one of my all-time favorites, Noah's Boas kept his hairs in pairs. <laughs> they should be funny. They should be funny. You should, a clear review should be funny. It should not be didactic. You know, if you want to make social commentary, which I know you do, <laughs> it still has to be funny. And if it's not funny, in fact, if it's really bad, the worst clear of you has a $25 fine. <laughs> it's tax deductible, but it is a fine. And you, will, you will be humiliated in front of everybody. So you know, keep in mind, you're taking a risk when you're writing clear of you. you could, True. You could get the worst clear of you. Yeah. So, but, but the winners get valuable prizes. So the, the clear of you forms are due tomorrow after lunch. So right at 1 p.m., right before the, 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 the afternoon speaker. Okay, so the forms are right there next to the cash register. Fill them out, turn them in, be inspired, and inspire others. Because we will publish them in Gilbert Magazine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, a uh, couple more things before we uh, continue with our first speaker, if he gets here. Well, I guess that's me. Um, <laughs> if I can find my talk. Okay. Uh, Last year, some of you remember, uh, who, were, who were at the conference last year, John Holland uh, from the Twin Cities uh, has been leading an amazing volunteer effort to type up all of Chesterton's writing. We're, we're collecting it all, but we're also gonna get it typed up to create a master database of all of his writings. And there's several people here tonight who are volunteer typists. If you're a volunteer typist, could you stand up so we could recognize you? Those of you who are thank you. <laughs> you are doing God's work, and if you are interested in helping with this project, come see me, and we'll set you up with, uh, with John Holland. Just to let you know, everyone, Chesterton wrote. We're, we're still calculating. We will. We will have a number when all this is done. But it, it's it's well over 15 million words. Five thousand literary essays. 5,000. If you were to write an essay a day, every day without taking Sundays off, it would take you 15 years to write 5,000 essays. Then you have to start in on your poems and your detective stories and your novels and that book on St. Thomas Aquinas that you always wanted to write, <laughs> as well as everything else that he wrote. It's, it's just an astonishing output and what we're accomplishing to get it all recorded and into a database, it's, it's been a monumental project. We've been working on it for years, but the end is in sight. It's really something, it's really, really great. One of the reasons, as you know, that Chester could, uh, why he was able to, to write such, such a great volume uh, of output in, in really only 30 some years of writing was, was that he could so often, often write two essays at one time. He could write one out in longhand 
and dictate an entirely different essay to his secretary at the same time. <laughs> and this would have been a good year to have a talk on Cecil Chesterton. In fact, I asked someone to give a talk this year on Cecil Chesterton, and he wanted to give a talk on something else. And uh, you can chastise him about that tomorrow because it's Joseph Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it. I could have given the talk on Cecil Chesterton, but then I couldn't give the talk that I'm about to give. And the talk on Cecil Chesterton would have been a great introduction to the talk that I'm about to give. So I couldn't do it either. But someday someone should give a talk on Cecil because it was Cecil who, in 1912, started the newspaper, The New Witness. And it was itself a successor to another paper called The Eyewitness, which had been started only a year earlier and was published by Hilaire Belloc. And uh, at that time, G.K. Chester was already very well known, very popular writer. He contributed poems and articles, essays to both those papers, especially to The, uh, to the New Witness, which was edited by his brother. In fact, his poem, Lepanto, was first published in The Eyewitness. But, uh, but these papers were not literary journals as such, they were political journals. In fact, they were originally dedicated to exposing political corruption. Uh, in fact, it was Cecil's exposure of a case of government insider trading, known as the Marconi scandal, that really lifted the eyes of, or lifted the scales off the eyes of the public and made people realize that their public servants that they had elected to serve them were much more interested in serving themselves. The sad irony behind the Marconi scandal is that instead of the corrupt officials that he exposed being thrown out of office, they actually went into higher office. One of them became prime minister, and one of them became the Lord Chief Justice, and all Cecil got for his trouble was to be sued for libel. It was a case he should have won, but he was very ill-prepared to defend himself, and he was found guilty and given a nominal fine. But this talk is not about the Marconi scandal. It's not about Cecil. I've already said that. It's about G.K. Chesterton's role in that paper, The New Witness, because it was exactly 100 years ago, in 1916, that Cecil, after several unsuccessful attempts managed to enlist in the British Army and join the Highland Light Infantry and march off to the Great War, which we call World War I. And his big brother, Gilbert, who, believe it or not, also attempted to uh, enlist in the Army, and also, or, or I should say, believe it or not, was declared physically unfit. <laughs> was left home in England, but also left in charge of the new witness as its editor. And after he'd been an editor for only a few weeks, he wrote a column in the new witness entitled, The Autobiography of a Bad Editor. <laughs> I am the worst editor in the world. <laughs> I have not held the shield, if I may so express it, for very long. And I never could have conceived that I should even compete for it. I no more expected to be an editor than to be a policeman. I faintly hope that all my faults, especially of omission, will be put down to incompetence and not discourtesy. But I cannot throw off the customary sensation that I'm writing for someone else's newspaper. At the present moment, I find myself writing this loose meditation, which grows more lumbering with every line until I find that I feel that no editor will print it. And I remember with thankfulness and wonder that I am the editor. <laughs> this gives me a glow of relief for a time. And I feel how fine it will be to sit in an office chair and open some promising and valuable communication from a contributor. And then I remember with a sordid, horrid, sinking feeling of the heart that I am the contributor. <laughs> Sooner or later, I suppose, my two capacities will collide in some way. And either I shall send myself something which no editor of my standing can be expected to accept, or else I shall do something to myself which no contributor of my spirit can be expected to tolerate. <laughs> and then I shall write to myself and say I regret that I cannot use my interesting contribution. 
and I'll probably write back to myself and ask why, in that case, I had not the decency to return the manuscript. <laughs> I can only promise not to take myself too seriously at either function, being already uncomfortably habituated to looking the fool in both. For one reason, I'm bound to do the work badly because I find it so interesting. In that, it's like life itself. Nearly the chief trouble of life is that there's nothing dull in it. It's not a waste of monotony, but a jungle of distractions. We are told of the editor yawning over heaps of merely tiresome trash, but I'm not sure it would affect me like that, even if I had more of it than I do. There are cartloads, of course, of things that are not, in the practical sense, worth printing, but I hardly admit that they are not worth reading. For all, from all there's something to be learned about human nature of public opinion. And these are not only greater things than journalism, but they will certainly outlast that apparently decaying institution. The most foolish of them would take all the wisdom of the world to answer. It's because I'm so enthusiastically, so utterly editorial that I cannot be an editor. I never saw a letter to this paper, published or unpublished, to which I would not want to add a note as long as an essay. And if I seem oblivious of a book sent last week, it's because I'm still occupied on one or two articles suggested by a postcard received last month. And, I, I, and even the communications which it's most impossible to publish are the most delightful to read. I'm speaking, of course, of those who I can kindly describe as lunatics. <laughs> For lunacy is a picturesque thing, so long as you keep outside of it, <laughs> like a prison or a tiger. That's perfect Chesterton essay. I think I figured out the problem. That's why I, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> He just sets things up perfectly. You notice how the, the beginning of this essay is humorous, but there's still profound, interesting observations. And he just delights you, and he brings you in happily. You're just coasting in, and then he pounces. Then he gets to the main point. And that's when he goes in like the eagle or the hawk and takes his prey. Because he says, it's the questions asked by the average man nowadays that are nine times out of 10 exceedingly intelligent questions. And if the answers are not worthy of the questions, that is not the fault of the many, but rather of the few. It is the fault of the stale oligarchy which rules almost the whole of our education and our news. The stale oligarchy that rules almost the whole of our education and our news. It's not the man in the, that the man in the street is stupid. At worst, he's stupefied. <laughs> much more often, he's, he's so much of a dupe that he cannot even be called a dunce. He commonly reasons reasonably enough upon all the information given to him, but the information given to him is given by a very unclean and secretive plutocratic clique, itself ignorant of most of the rest. And this is nearly all there is in the alleged anarchy and the folly of the modern mob. For instance, very few indeed of the 10 million men who read newspapers know that there are only about 10 men who own them. In other words, they have not the faintest idea that there is long existed an omnipotent private censorship of the press, that every fact they read is filtered through a carefully constructed instrument only differing from the Inquisition in being irresponsible. <laughs> Very few indeed of the 10 million men who buy goods know that the tra trade is dominated by a heartless and fraudulent method of forestalling, freezing out, and wholesale adulteration of commercial combinations. Very few indeed, very nearly none, 
of those who do know that such commercial infamies flourish, know that such infamies can be punished and prevented. They have been punished and prevented in the past, especially in the Middle Ages. Men are not in the smallest degree stupid because they do not know these things, and they will be, I venture to hope, very much the reverse of stupid when they do come to know. This is what brings me back to the pleasure of being an editor, even a bad editor, for it is my very cool and sober conviction that I am not the bad editor of a bad paper. Because the purpose of the New Witness was to tell the truth when no other papers were doing it. And he agreed to be the editor of his brother's paper because he believed in the paper. He thought he was doing a valuable duty, reporting facts that were not being reported anywhere else, providing a philosophy that was contrary to the one that was being forced into the head of the common man who read the popular press. Of, he believed in fighting that that oligarchy that rules almost the whole of our education and our news. In The New Witness, Chesterton can say what he can't say in any of the other papers that he writes for. And so can all the others who write for The New Witness. They can write what they believe, not what they're getting paid to say, because the fact is they're not getting paid anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> like the writers for Gilbert Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> they contribute their work for free, they make their money writing for other papers saying what sells. The New Witness, as I said, was originally started for the purpose of exposing political corruption, but it takes on a much new, newer tone under the editorship of G.K. Chesterton. It's a much, well, I have to say, it's a less negative tone in that he's not just criticizing bad policies and bad practices and bad ideas that are everywhere. He starts to offer an alternative, something positive. And I, the idea that people should not only rule themselves, but work for themselves and think for themselves. That both politics and trade and education should be controlled locally by those who are most affected by them, and not remotely by those who are not accountable. His rejection of capitalism and of Socialism, of big business and of big government. His idea that we should create an economy, a society, a culture that's based on the family, based on tradition rather than trends, on small ownership and independence and liberty rather than on wage slavery and welfare and restriction. This idea that would eventually be called distributism, though that I that title would not emerge until almost 10 years later. This is what Chesterton was doing when he agreed to fill in as the editor of The New Witness. But what he didn't know is that his temporary job would not be temporary because the unthinkable happened. His brother Cecil died in a French military hospital right at the end of World War I, and Chesterton found himself holding the paper permanently and running it as long as he could. He ran it for seven more years. In spite of doing a lot of heavy lifting, he couldn't keep it sustainable, and he, he let it cease publication so that he could start over, start fresh, uh, and carry on his dead brother's legacy with a new paper, with his own imprint on it, a new, new witness called GK's Weekly. And this man who called himself the worst editor in the world would be the editor of a newspaper for the rest of his life. And it was an act of sacrifice. Because there were people who really pleaded with him to keep writing great literature. But Chesterton was a fighter for justice, and he believed it was more pressing to try to create a just society than to leave the world with another piece of art. And, uh, and yet, in spite of that, he did continue to create great art. In fact, he continued to create it right in The New Witness. What's really interesting is that during World War I, Chesterton actually, with a, 
with a group of 25 of England's most important writers. You name them, they all agreed to do it. They all agreed to work on behalf of the, the British government for war propaganda, to, to support the war in their writing. Because they believed in using their talents to, to, to support what, what England was doing, fighting against uh, Germany. And, and Chester, there was no problem to, to do that because he was, he was very much against uh, the philosophy that was coming out of Germany, much less the, uh, the idea of Germany conquering Europe. And, uh, and so most of his writing elsewhere is a one-note theme during World War I about the war, whereas in The New Witness, there's more variety in his writing than anywhere else. Uh, we're talking about over 500 essays. I've read them all, and they are delightful, delightful stuff. Great variety of writing. Uh, even though he's, um, he's writing, uh, even though it's still a political paper, he, he writes about art, he writes about literature, he writes about religion. But if he's political, he's also prophetic. If there's ever a strain in his voice, it's the strain of the voice of a prophet who's calling for repentance. Warning of a very bleak future, of the destruction of society. Just like the Hebrew prophets warned of old. To no avail in some cases. Chesterton writes in 1919, For decades we have been tolerating things that all, that all we have been tolerating all the things that all the ages have denounced and that very few ages have even tolerated. We have not been progressing towards a morality that nobody understood. We have been violating a morality that everybody understood. And our real progress will begin when we know that we are on the wrong road. Very prophetic. But who is he writing for? Who are the readers of the New Witness? That's a good question. And the answer to the questions are not the same. Because uh, he wasn't necessarily writing for the people he really, or the people who were reading were not necessarily the people he was writing for. On the one hand, he's writing, he is the voice of the common man. He's not writing for the common man because the common man already has common sense, says Chesterton. And uh, it's, it's the, the strange intellectuals with their weird ideas, who need to have common sense reinfused into their lives. He wrote a review of a book called The Equipment of the Workers, a book I'm sure that none of you have ever read, a book that none of you ever will read. It was the results of a survey taken by social workers uh, who interviewed hundreds of poor people about their artistic tastes and their moral religious feelings. And the social workers, like, like naturalists who are observing zebras or monkeys, <laughs> classified these poor people into three categories. The mal-equipped, the well-equipped, and the inadequately equipped. And Chesterton said when he read the book, he considered himself one of the mal-equipped. <laughs> Even though one of the test questions asked of the poor to see if they were well equipped was whether or not they had ever read G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> uh, but he decided that he must be one of the mal-equipped because uh, he didn't care for his success as a writer, but for the success of the truths about which he wrote. And he said he was writing for, not for the poor, but on behalf of the poor. He's writing not for the common man, but on behalf of the common man. He's writing for the intellectuals and the social leaders and the professors and the politicians who have neglected the poor, who have ignored the poor, who have created the, the, the strange conditions of public education, who have ignored the women and the children who they claim to represent. And he proceeds to list the opinions of the poor which reflect his own. They think that there's too much talk about education and not enough about life. They think that they're not really free to do what they want. They think that the government interferes with their lives. They think that the rich have too much influence in the government. 
His main ideas are freedom and democracy. The emphasis of the local and the universal over the remote and the specialized. The normal as opposed to the abnormal. Common sense. He says the thing we call common sense suffers from too much evidence in its favor. He's a defender of freedom and democracy because he's a defender of common sense. They go together. They go together. I possess a certain proportion of popular sympathies. I think that the popular instinct generally goes to the point. I have not only a sneaking tenderness for common people, but a weakness for confiding in their common sense. The popular custom is the only the popular rule. Without popular custom, we are wretchedly reduced to popular education, which should be called anti-popular education. <laughs> when he talks about education, well, first before, I mean, his point about education is that education has become the object of politics. It's controlled by politicians and not by parents. It should be the parents who control education control what is taught. Instead, it's, it's now up to the government to determine what is taught. And, um, and before I talk about education, I just want to mention what he says about, about government. He says that it's the man who will defend his field and defy his government who is just the sort of man who will defend his government and defy the world. The whole trick of electioneering consists of forcing people to a choice of evils. <laughs> it's needless to say that the journalists do not always tell the truth about the politicians. What surprises me so often is that they do not even know the truth about the politicians. A politician with a future means a politician with a forgotten past. <laughs> that almost went down the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Chesterton's point is that if we do not rule ourselves, we will be ruled by someone else. Democracy means ruling ourselves. And voting is not to be confused with democracy. Just like going to church is not to be confused with being a Christian. There's much more to being a Christian than going to church. There's much more to democracy than casting a vote. It means truly ruling ourselves and governing ourselves, which means also controlling ourselves, but experiencing the freedom that comes with self-rule and not letting those functions be replaced by non-elected officials. Because Chester says the worst problem with growth of government is the bureaucracy that is not accountable to anybody. And especially in a top-heavy society, we're ruled by unelected bureaucrats who certainly do not reflect the values of the common man and certainly do not reflect common sense. The semi-official reformer, he says, flying around with a fad might kill 80 babies without having to bury any of them. And because we give so much power to the bureaucrat, we start to feel helpless. And this powerlessness creates a hopelessness. And he says we're not divided now into those who know and who do not know. We are divided into those who care and who do not care. What else does democracy mean? As I said, it means not only ruling ourselves, but determining what is taught to our children and not having that determined by a government official. Public schools do not represent parents and they do not represent common sense. If children, Chesterton says, see that their teachers despise what their parents desire, there is and there must be a conflict of authorities and there is and must be in the modern state the monstrous discovery that there's a new and unnatural authority that has the power. They talk a great deal about education because it's compulsory education. Whether or no they can educate, they are always eager to compel. 
But as a fact, their aim is the very contrary of education. It's the destruction of education, even the destruction of experience. It is to make men forget the past, forget the facts, forget the very memories of their own lives. And if their compulsory culture spreads successfully, it is very likely that we shall be all alone in knowing what was known to every man. Official education has given great power to the rise of official science. And Chesterton points out in the New Witness that the charges conventionally brought against the church are now much more true of physical science because it's, it's science that attacks the church, it's science that has political ambitions, it's science that seeks to use the secular arm, and it's science that would persecute and enslave. The cult of hygiene today is not so much materialistic as mystical, he says. Health is preferred to life. And the experts seem to be more satisfied with a well-nourished corpse than a lively cripple. <laughs> the object of democracy is to be able to argue, which we cannot do anymore. Controversy is a good thing. Chesterton says no good ever came from a one-sided controversy. <laughs> <laughs> no two views coincide at every point. The object of controversy, he says, is conversion. Which brings us to an interesting point. Because it was while Chesterton was the editor of the New Witness that he surprised the entire world when it was announced that he had been received into the Catholic Church in 1922. You could see his whole life leading up to it. Anybody who was watching it closely could see what was happening. In fact, a lot of people thought he already was Catholic. Um, and then there were some who thought he would never be so stupid as to do anything like that. <laughs> but he wrote about, in, in his New Witness article, he writes, interestingly enough, about two pivotal figures in history. One of them is John Milton. John Milton, the great poet of Paradise Lost. And he says the thing about Milton is that he was a Protestant. And he, 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 he had his own religion. And he rejected a traditional religion and tried to create his own view of the world. And it was an attitude that made him approve of divorce. It was a, the, the, the difference, uh, a fundamental difference seen in, his, in the place of women in Paradise Lost as compared to the, the role of women in Dante's Divine Comedy. The one, uh, he says, uh, <coughs> The two symbolic statues of women, at least of equal importance in each scheme, one represented the weak woman by whom Satan entered the world, and the other the strong woman by whom God entered the world. Isn't that beautiful? Milton and his Puritans deliberately battered and obliter obliterated the image of the good woman and carefully preserved the bad woman to be a standing reproach to womanhood. He also says the interesting view towards art. Milton represents a change in the view towards art because the focus becomes the, on the work of art itself and not what it is about. So that we are in awe of the work of art rather than in awe of the world in which that, that artist is, is creating. Uh, we should be in awe. Make us, he says the difference between the, the two senses of art is focus on the artist rather than focus on what he's, the, the, the new creation. Um, the new artists are always trying to find a new nerve of surprise, but that alone shows that the normal nerves have been abnormally jaded. The difference between them and the medieval primitives is that they are not fresh minds appealing to other fresh minds, but stale minds appealing to other stale minds. Even if the best of them are still making an effort to startle themselves out of their staleness. 
The other writer that Chesterton points out is a pivotal uh, player, to not steal anybody's term, uh, in terms of the modern world, is Nietzsche. And Chesterton recognizes this early on. He recognizes how Nietzsche has just seduced the intellectuals and how he has really created a madness in Germany based on, on this, this evolutionary dominance of other people, the Superman, the Ubermensch. And, uh, and he says that in The New Witness that Nietzsche was a man who tried to be a mood. Every man who tries to be a mood instead of a mind is necessarily narrow. And that is why most of the modern moralists are notably narrow. Such a man stands for one moment of revolt or reaction or refusal, whatever that might be, but the test of it is that he's always deficient in something else that sane men have, such as laughter or compassion or conservative sentiment. All of that explains Nietzsche. And there are moods, he says, when I can sympathize with the quivering nerve of nobility running through that unnatural state in Nietzsche especially when it quivered in protest against something really noble in the smug utilitarianism of the 19th century. If I were locked up alone for 10 years with Herbert Spencer, I might come out feeling like Nietzsche. <laughs> but that's only another way of saying that if I were locked up for 10 years with Herbert Spencer, I would come out raving mad, like Nietzsche. <laughs> so, as long as I consider myself sane, I shall consider myself superior merely at some point of spiritual freedom and flexibility to those prophets in constrained, fantastic postures. For the madman might almost be defined as the man in whom the mood has become the mind. The really sincere philosophy is Chesterton has to be inside of everything, not outside of everything. About doctrine, there should be certainty and clarity. About details, there should be frank ignorance and free debate. The fashion in the more fashionable press seems to be precisely the opposite. The great papers are fickle about the big things and infallible about the small things. Ooh, someone's asking for a $25 fine. <laughs> it's tax deductible. The man who professes a creed confesses a partiality for the creed. And when he loves it, he's necessarily partial. But when he hates it, he generally professes to be impartial. He pretends that the thing he hates is obstructing his way to other things, such as education, or hygiene, or science, or social reform. It was a few days after he wrote these words when he became Catholic. Because he confessed his partiality for a creed, for something that was the ultimate reality. He says, men talk of ritual as something unreal. It's the chief business of ritual to bring men back to a larger reality. The biggest facts are forgotten because they are big. But they are nonetheless facts, although men have to sometimes be forced to remember them. For G.K. Chester, for Chester, Chesterton, the big fact was the incarnation. And the access to that big fact through the fact of the sacraments, that connection which is a truth that affects all truths. And to that truth, G.K. Chesterton became a new witness. Last year, our esteemed editor, Sean Daly, talked about G.K. Chesterton as a model of lay spirituality. And he certainly proved to be that. He proved to be the very thing that, that the Second Vatican Council was hoping the lay people would become. Someone who could stand up and testify in a coherent and compassionate, in a reasonable and believable and beautiful way, the truths of the faith. Chesterton says that the truth put, puts hooks into people. The truth puts hooks into people. 
in the manner of that ancient and magnificent metaphor which sent forth men to be fishers of men. The truth puts, put, puts hooks into people. Gilbert Magazine has carried on the work of Chesterton's publications, The New Witness and G.K.'s Weekly. The Chesterton Academies, which we've had a great privilege to be involved in, have carried on his ideas about taking control of education, putting parents back in charge of the formation of their children's minds. We're calling you as members of the American Chesterton Society to be new witnesses. Let's be reminded that uh, the word witness in its Greek form is martyr. The word martyr and witness are the same word. Being a new witness, being a true witness might come with a great cost, but also a great reward. Chesterton says if there are ghastly things to be faced, the only thing we can do is make it glorious to face them. And to allow the horror of martyrdom to eclipse the halo of the martyr would be a very bad confusion of thought. There's a great glory in being a witness for the truth. As Chesterton says, the hagiological way is the logical way. Though its embodiments may seem extreme and startling, as logical things often do, I'm thankful to be a fellow new witness with you. God bless. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just grateful once again that you're all here. We're going to take about a 20 minute break. We'll come back for, for Marco. We'll almost be back on time. All right? God bless. See you in 20 minutes.